Welcome to my living room. Today we're gonna to be talking about why recitative even matters. The medium of opera conveys great stories of joy and woe, using staging and most importantly music to convey the story and move the audience. The main vehicle used to convey emotion is the aria, and the context and information are in the recitative, situated between arias. This art of the recitative, as set by the composer and performed by the singer, is not consistent and static, but flexible to suit the needs of the story, helping to set up a sense of space and place within the context of said story. The aria O Quante Volte, composed by Bellini, is preceded by a notoriously tricky recitative. This recitative presents both a particularly virtuosic vocal line, as well as the challenge of interpreting the syntax and rhythm of the text. The recitative's excellent execution can show the educated audience that the performer really knows their stuff. An artist who really knows their stuff brings the audience into the story by creating a palpable sense of space that the story is set in, and a sense of the stakes that are currently taking place. O quante volte stakes are high for our protagonist, Juliet. From the Vincenzo Bellini opera I Capuletti e i Mongetti, the story of Romeo and Juliet. The recitative accounts for her deep distress as she is getting ready, dressed in fine wedding attire, for her arranged marriage to a man she does not love that her family has chosen for her. The emotional core of a scene relies upon the aria and focuses on the main theme of the scene. The aria may be set with minimal, oft-repeated text to convey the simple core idea of a scene, such as, with what passion I adore you, and in comparison, the recitative sets up the context, or what is at stake for those involved in the current situation, and tends to be text heavy. An example being, here I am adorned like a victim for the altar. This is Juliet speaking. <laughs> Going on to set up the perspective in our situation Juliet has within the scene. These textual differences between the aria and recitative are critical when considering how the story is moved forward, but are by no means the only tool used to set a scene or space or place within the story. These textual differences between aria and recitative are critical when considering how the story is moved forward, but are by no means the only tool used to set a scene or space and place within the story. After all, when we have an opera, we have music as well as text. The musical difference between aria and recitative are, for the most part, easily discernible. Within an aria, musical ideas are often invented, repeated, and developed, whereas with the recitative, rarely is there repetition of a musical idea, and phrases often have no tonal resolution. While both the recitative and aria have a written metrical duration, within the measure, the recitative treats this very differently than the aria. In the aria, due to the interlaced reliance on the orchestral part, remaining metrical and staying true to the pre-established tempo is essential. It results in a more powerful whole, best able to communicate the emotional impact the aria is written to accomplish. The recitative does not adhere to the same metrical rules. Often it has little orchestral underpinning and there is an absence of a consistent pulse. The sparse or complete lack of orchestral accompaniment serves to create freedom for the singer. The singer's creative contributions and individual relationship with the role and story, our focus being on the recitative section, are able to be revealed within the recitative. An excellent execution brings an audience into the moment. Where are we? What is happening? And how should we feel about what's going on? The job of the recitative is to set the space in place, and the lack of metrical rigidity allows for more freedom for a singer to bring their own personal flavor, not to mention the years of established performance practice. Within the recitative, notated duration of notes and rests are often the lengths they are in order to fulfill a math the mathematical needs of the measure. It is important to note that in 19th century, 4-4 meter was used pretty ubiquitously as a default. The metrical necessity does not always reflect the syntactical needs of the text. In order to properly reflect the musical and stir needs of the recitative, one needs to defer from written notation to performance practice, and one's individual interpretation informed by the needs of the text. Okay, next we're gonna do some singing examples. Please join me tomorrow, but also right now. <laughs> 
Hey everybody, let's take a look at the recitative. I'm going to speak through it in English, and later when I do some singing examples, you're going to be able to see the uh, according Italian. Just a quick caveat, the text I have chosen as the translation is from IPA Source, a professional word-for-word -word translation. Okay, here we go. Here I am in festive clothing. Here I am adorned like a victim for the altar. Oh, if only I could, like a victim, fall at the feet of the altar. O oh, nuptial torches, hated, so, so fateful, will be, ah, will be for me the flames of death. I burn a blaze, a fire consumes me. And then she goes to open a window. A comfort from the winds I call for in vain. Where are you, Romeo? In what lands do you wander? Where, where shall I send to you my sighs? Stop in thinking about Romeo and wishing that he was here to take her away from, from this wedding that she does not want. When we sing the recitati, we really want to emphasize the train of thought, the winsomeness of this text. Oh, I wish I was somewhere else. I wish that I wasn't in this situation. And she wishes that she was with Romeo. So, um, let's go to some singing examples and see how we can shape this text in order to really, really focus on creating a clear sense of space and place in which we, the listener, is being drawn into. We're going to look mainly at the first page of the recitative. Here I am in festive clothing. Here I am adorned like a victim for the altar. So first thing to consider is in this first system, you have these um, grace notes in clothing, vesta, as well as in adorna, adorned, and for the altar, um, alara. So these are written as if they have um, an eighth note uh, coming down to a quarter note. Um, so, and so when I have coached this, it turns out that performance practice a lot of time is to ignore the um, the coming down to that quarter note, as you can see here in my example, which I'm going to put there. Um, so if you're doing it as written, it sounds like I did before, but if you're doing it according to pra performance practice, it would be So you can see how we have that quarter note value is being attributed to that A flat coming down to the G only at the end. The emphasis in the word vesta is on the vesta. Here I am adorned in festive clothing. It's very sad. It's, it has a sense of slow solemnity, which when we follow performance practice, it accentuates this. If you do it like, that sounds a little more cheerful compared to you know, less movement, more grounded, more um, solemn. The same thing applies to Adorna. If you were to do it that way, it has more of a sprightly affect to it as opposed to doing it according to performance practice where you have that grace note acting with the full value of the note following. An example being So there's less of a sense of gaiety or flippancy especially in the context of this because she is feeling like she has no choices. She is a sacrifice, you know, adorned like a victim for the altar, exactly as the text says. 
You don't want to be, oh, here I am adorned like a victim for the altar. It's like, no, here I am adorned like a victim for the altar. In the next phrase, we have, ah, if only I could, like a victim, fall before their feet. Humbling herself to ask for what she really wants, to spare her, essentially, getting married to this guy feels like a prison sentence. And it sounds like this. We have another of those grace notes or appoggiatura notes that where we attribute the full value of the note, the note following the grace note to the grace note. So in that adds a little more gravity and weight, not on the voice, but in the setting of the scene to that falling at the feet, falling at the feet. Here I am falling at the feet. That's a very different tone too. Falling at the feet. You know, taking that time and allowing for the space to be filled, not only by your voice, but space creates um, expectancy. So by lengthening that note, you draw the listener in more. In the next phrase, we can see how respecting the score over performance practice may not always come in handy when coming to communicate the text into its fullest. This is my poetic recitation. If you were to read it with the rest written in, it would be, oh, nuptial torches, hated, so, so fateful will be, ah, will be for me, the flames of death. Um, I've been coached and I agree that you want to kind of ignore the rest before will be for me the flames of death. Creating that space after for me and kind of ignoring it before the for me. Let's do a comparison. Seality. Ah, will be for me. By making that little change, you connect the phrases in a way that's more natural for the native listener, as well as creating more of a sense of line for you as the singer. This sort of work should be done throughout the recitative and in any recitative that you're doing. Coach with somebody who knows what they're doing. Use your own experience with text and with recitative to inform the choices that you are making in order to create a story that makes sense according to the text and according to the music. Thank you so much for joining me.